Hi folks, this is Nigel Merrick from the Xenolog Photography Business and Marketing website and today I'm thrilled to be able to spend some time with Mr. AJ Leon who proudly describes himself as the chief troublemaker of Mis Misfits Incorporated, a nomadic creative shop that specializes in changing the world. They've worked on unique game-changing projects in places as far away as England, Sudan, Tanzania, Indonesia, Kenya, Ethiopia, and all over the, the United States. And AJ left a lucrative career in finance to pursue a more meaningful life and to find and work on projects that he felt really mattered and could make a difference. One of AJ's driving forces is, is his belief that none of us were put here to live a life of conformity and mediocrity and that anyone and everyone can change the world in some fashion. In fact, I have a quote here on the screen from one of AJ's essays which I feel really sums up this highly inspiring individual and I'll just quickly read that out and he says, you know, there are times when we sail so far off course and when our dreams are so far from reach that they appear but balmy glimmers violently strewn on a distant horizon which we will, we will never pierce. When complacency and compliance and when safety and security have so entranced us that gradual reform is no longer possible, in those moments we have but one option and that is to revolt and I, and I just think that that is, uh, that is so fantastic. So welcome AJ, it's really great to have you here with me today. It's great to be here. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, I know that uh, I was really surprised uh, to hear from you originally when you uh, you emailed me just out of the blue. And I think you, you even made a point in your email to say, please do not delete this email. This is not a, a spam email. This is an actual yeah. actual yeah. email. It just made me laugh. Yeah. That was really funny. But yeah, um, that's, it. that's about the only way you can get people to respond these days. Because everybody, you know, in a world of autoresponders, it's you know everybody just thinks uh, they're they're getting hit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. So, one of the things that I believe in as a as a business coach for photographers is to infuse the industry with as much knowledge and expertise as possible from the outside, bringing in new strategies and ideas and concepts that can help photographers reach the next level in their business and also in the way they think about the business. Now, you certainly fit the bill as a creative thinker and doer and you're, you're not actually outside of the photography industry per se, um, but I know that people are going to get a great deal out of this uh, this chat with, that we're having today. So, gosh, I, gosh, I hope so. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. So, can you give us a quick intro to your idea of the what you call the pursuit of everything? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I launched The Pursuit of Everything as a website um, on my birthday this last year. And basically, I mean, my concept of The Pursuit of Everything is to, to live with intention. And that means to live deliberately, to make your own decisions and not allow your life to be governed by social scripts. Um, and secondly, to do work that truly matters. And that is you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. The, the way you define that is up to you. But if it, I mean, typically, if you you know that it matters, if it matters to you. And then third is is uh, to live a life of service and to give more than you get. And I think most people, yeah, most of us, in, in our greatest dreams of what our lives could be, um, we we want to encapsulate those three things. You know, so that's that's kind of generally what I'm referring to. Right, and. You know, you uh, you had a, originally a career in finance. You had what we would call a traditional, well-paying job, and uh, you know it's not every day that people just decide to quit that life and do something sort of off the wall, like like you did. What was the catalyst that made you make that leap in the beginning? I mean, uh, that day when I left, for me, it was it was. Uh, um, what I like to call a brief moment of audacity, you know, my brief moment of audacity. Sometimes that is exactly what separates us from the life we live and the life that you were destined to lead. And for me, it was 40, four days before Melissa and I, my beautiful wife, we're still married, uh, got married, and I was up for a big promotion in, 
in uh, this job in Wall Street. And I had done all the things right that you do. I'd gone to a good school. I you know, got great notes and grades and went to a big firm and then vertically to a bigger firm. And, and then I found myself um, up for a promotion that would have put me in a pretty high income bracket. And it, it would have changed my life forever in a way that I, would, I wouldn't have had the ability to walk away from it ever. So sitting there, you know, four days before I get married, looking at this big promotion I have, looking out my window um, in downtown Manhattan, I just had tears coming down my eyes because I realized I was trapped. You know, I, w I was living some other guy's life. I had been duped. And, and I realized that there was no way out until it occurred to me, wait a second, I can leave. I can leave right now, and if I don't leave at this very moment, if right now I don't walk out that door, I'm going to be this dude for the rest of my life. And the prospect of that was much more terrifying at that moment than the prospect of how I was going to pray rent next month. So I took my stuff, and I just walked out, and I've never looked back. And um, yeah, <laughs> I don't offer it as a, as a life plan. When people ask me for advice, I'm like, I, you know, I, I'm not I'm not offering that as a life plan. Uh, that that's the honest truth of what happened to me. Right, you, you know, and and I can. I can empathize with that to a certain extent. You know, I spent many years in the corporate world. I was a computer programmer and systems designer for, gosh, over 20 years or so. Wow. And uh, my last paying job, as it were, you know, for, for the man, I suppose you might say, was um, as a project manager for, for a bank in Bermuda. And, you know, to all intents and purposes, we had a great life. I, uh, you know, had a great apartment overlooking the harbor. I had a boat. I, I was able to go windsurfing. I, I was a scuba diver. I, I you know, it, I worked on an island where it never snowed. You know, which is a great advantage for me because I'm not a big fan of the cold. Uh, you know, and I had a great job. And, and but I felt, you know, sitting at that desk every day that there was just something missing. There was, uh, I, I, you know, I had this creative urge in me to do something that was to me felt a little bit more meaningful and yeah. I, at that time I had a hobby as an underwater photographer and one of my f friends uh, I think he I think he had put a few pints inside me before he said this and he said uh, well you you seem really good at the photography underwater he said have you thought about doing it as a job and uh, opening up a, a photo center, you know, in the Red Sea in Egypt, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, right, whatever." Uh, <laughs> and uh, this was this was back in '99, uh, and uh, the Y2K bug nonsense was pretty big at that time, and was having a oh, huge a glorious time. Oh, it was wonderful, yeah. I mean, the, the end of the world was, uh, I think, for the 15th time or something was happening. And <laughs> and uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, my girlfriend and I at the time, we quit and we went to Egypt and checked it out and said, okay, well, let's, let's do this. And people were saying things like, you must be crazy. What, what's the matter with you? You know, you're giving up this job and you, you're going across the world to somewhere completely... Uh, different. You don't even speak the language, and how in the what, what, what do you do if it goes wrong? And, I, and I, I, at that time, I just said, "Well, I guess uh, I'll do something else." You know, because I can't stand to sit here day in and day out and become what I consider to be something that that is not really who I am. And so I I understand. I love that so much. I love that. Love you know. That story. I really understand, you know, where you're coming from with all of this, and you know, and I followed your newsletter, and I and I and I, and I love everything that you 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 do, and the way that your sort of philosophy and your approach to life and the world, and your your ability to help people in what you do. I was blown away when I when I came across this misfit incorporated idea. You know, this. In fact, let me uh, let me pull up your uh, your website. I might lose your video for just a second here, but we'll see. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get you right back. Uh, there you go. Uh, so this is this is the website for Misfit Inc. And as you can see, this is just this is a really great looking website. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. But you know, you guys, you know, you you you're almost what I consider to be the international rescue of the 
creative world. You know, it's like okay, there's a there's somebody called in with a problem somewhere somewhere in far off land, and you pack your bags, you throw all your laptops in, and off you go, and that's it. You know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, how's called the misfits? Yeah. So I mean, how did this how did this idea come about? You know, as a uh, creative um, creative thing. Um, the idea for misfitting. I mean, it wasn't at first. You know, I didn't. I didn't leave my career to do something else. I left my career because my career was trying to assassinate who I was. You know, my, it was trying to kill me. Um, so I, I ended up leaving with no plan. And over a period of self-discovery. Um, where I was basically hunting cats in Tompkins Square Park for dinner and just trying to figure out how to put money on the table. <laughs> or, you know, when Melissa and I were like going up the Brooklyn Bridge, just picking out little spots with a nice view, you know. Uh, and, and it was, it, it was, a, it was a rough, time. you know, financially it was a rough time, but it was a time of self-discovery and and trying to figure out who I was the things that I believe and what they represent on this planet and, and what I'm about. And over time, that developed into this concept. And, and Misfit is now many things. Misfit is a creative agency, so we, we actually have worked uh, with lots of clients um, on, on different projects, some in the developing world with NGOs doing cool fundraising projects, some um, clients here in the States. And we also have launched a creative arts magazine and, and we're launching a, a conference by the time this goes live. Our conference will go live, which is going to be in Fargo in June. Um, so we've done quite a few things. But the central ethos to that is the idea of um, nonconformity, uh, noncompliance, and most importantly, just a defiance against a, a world that tells you that you have to live by, by their rules. Um, and so Misfit, it, it's, it, it obviously is my company, but it centers around an ideology which is based on the fact that we can live, live deliberately, you know, that, that what we were told as kids growing up, while it may have applied to a previous generation, it doesn't necessarily apply now. Um, and there are plenty of examples of people who run interesting com com companies and have interesting lives like yourselves, like the cool things that, that you get a chance to do. Um, and, and, and that's, so, so Misfit is like, you know, there's this central ideology. We, we have our company and then we run projects on, on uh, and we have several projects in, in, in Misfit that we have launched, um, but it centers around that ethos. Right, right. You know, and I think many photographers today and, uh, and certainly a lot of other individuals too in other creative disciplines, they're getting so discouraged you know they're even comp claiming that the industry is dead and that we have no real future as professionals because you know that that sort of traditional idea of the small town photographer with his studio and having people just filing in and out of the door just doesn't seem to fit you know quite as much now but photographers are almost f trying to force themselves into that model uh, when it really it doesn't all, it doesn't apply, you know, quite as much. And you know, I totally disagree with the idea that the photography industry is dying. And you know, I, I, I'll, you know, I'll fight that one to the very end. Uh, you know, but you know, what, what's your sort of take on on this idea based on what you see around you in 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 the world? Well, I mean, you know, one interesting example, which some of your uh, listeners may abhor, <laughs> but I will give this example, is I was sitting um, in a coffee shop at um, The Bean in, in the East Village, just right before I took off my journey, well, a couple months before um, this journey around the world that I'm on right now, and, and a friend of mine, Josh, his name is on Twitter, is at JDX, and it's at JDX.me, he was showing me all these great photos that he was taking around the East Village on his iPhone, and this is right when the iPhone 4S had come out, so they're all like just photos to be taken around town, and he's a photographer, I mean, he's done uh -huh. work on traditional cameras and, and, and uh, done paid work and all that, and 
he and I said, dude, why don't you start a blog and, and just you know create a blog? It's just in East Village. I mean, he just lives and breathes this neighborhood in New York, the East Village. And if you're from around the East Village, you know that this is like anyone from the East Village is just you just all day long. You know, you rep the East Village. And so he started this blog on Tumblr, um, and he started just every day. You know, he'd walk around, take one photo, and then he'd edit it on his phone. Everything on his phone, you know, through Photoshop on his phone and all that. And today, Josh has like 40,000 followers on Tumblr, and he has sold some of his pieces, all iPhoneography, for over $1,000. He sells pieces that he mounts for $1,000 a piece. Mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty stunning thing, you know, to say that you could just go. But I, you know, it's obviously uh, creative art and photography in specific is the, the it's not dead. It's just changing. Everything's amalgamating, you know. And he, you know, people people follow him. He has tribe you know, now, Josh, and he has the ability to put this out. But probably because he chose a niche and he chose to do something very different. And perpendicular to what most photographers out there in his in his world were doing. Yeah, and and it, and it's interesting that you bring that up because the iPhone certainly has changed photography for the masses, probably at least as much, if not more so, than the advent of the digital camera to begin with. And there are so many photographers out there who was, you know, they bring out their spears and pitchforks and say, death to the iPhoneographer, you know, this, this, <laughs> we can't have this, this is just crazy, you know. And, and while I wouldn't necessarily advocate shooting somebody's wedding with an iPhone, although I have heard <laughs> rumors that there are such, such atrocities occurring around the world, uh, <laughs> I think... To the chagrin of, step of, of, of mother-in-laws everywhere. Yeah, really, yeah. I mean, it's like, is the photographer here? Yeah, he's been here all day. He's been, is the guy with his iPhone, okay. He has the iPhone 5 and not the 4, you know, it's like. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's like, there's this kind of resistance to embracing that kind of technology. Now, your friend has obviously made for himself a, 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 a great niche for uh, creating that kind of work and selling it, and I'm not suggesting that every photographer should go out there and and do the same thing, whether you're a portrait photographer or a wedding photographer or whatever. But do you think that uh, there's the ability for that kind of thing? So let's say a wedding photographer to go out and say, "Okay, I'm going to put my fancy digital SLR camera away." And I'm going to go out and I'm going to shoot with my iPhone and see what I can do with it for a day, just for a, as a personal project. Yeah. How, how, do you, what are you saying? Well, you know, how do you, how do you feel that might alter their perspective on their own creativity, perhaps? Well, I, you know, I think the, I think the, the 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 most interesting thing about what my friend Josh did and what some photographers I see going out there doing interesting things are it's is is that it's bold, you know. I mean, ninety nine percent of his shots are free, right? He just puts it out there, and and it's kind of bold to say that I'm the iPhone for the village. I mean, that's a that's you're putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't hide in the mix of I'm just another portrait photographer. Um, you're putting your yourself out there, your art to be judged, you know, your idea to be judged, and I think that. In the end, as Ovid, you know, Ovid so eloquently says, uh, the gods favor the bold, you know, and and the reality is that, that people attracted to boldness. So, if you're a photographer and you have a traditional business, um, obviously there's no there's no problem with that. But it might behoove a photographer, I think, to think about some interesting creative project that maybe has a very tertiary tie to revenue but would get people's attention in a way that portrait photography or just wedding photography might not. And that might, in, in a way, you know, creating a community around your creative concepts and your ideas. And that could be any number of things. I mean, for Josh, it was his neighborhood and just taking pictures of street art and trash. And for you, no matter where you are in the world, it could be something else. But I think that that level of boldness is attractive. And on, on the web, it's easier to spread. You know, I, I, I quite agree with that. And, uh, you know, I think 
the the average consumer can react to the creative energy in, in a photographer when they can see something more personal in in their work and and I think you know I would I would probably bet that uh, you know if your friend in on the you know in New York or whatever just suddenly decided to open up a portrait studio he would have people lining up outside the door uh, because of the, the the other stuff that he does because he's created this persona this creative entity around himself and, and and I think there's you know there's a, there's an opportunity there for more traditional photographers to rather than rebel against this wave of uh, of technology is to embrace it as a chance to take advantage of it yeah, yeah. Take, pick up some new opportunities and and so you know, for you know, for the full-time pro photographer, you know, who's running a, what you might call the traditional studio or wedding photography and that kind of thing, who feels kind of stuck right now in their business. You know, maybe maybe they feel somewhat trapped in the same way that uh, you and I felt trapped in the corporate world. But you know, they're not trapped because their creativity is being stifled. They just feel trapped because they can't make a the living that they want. What what advice might you give? them to help sort of widen the horizon, if you like, of their possibilities? I mean, my, my first piece of advice would probably be to, to you know, to just sit down and, 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 you know, in a room with a notebook and say, if you didn't have to make any money with photography, so say, you know, I, I cut you a check for a million dollars tomorrow, A, would you keep taking photos? You know, if the answer to that is, uh, no, then I think you have bigger problems. Um, if the answer to that is yes, what would you do? You know, I mean, what what turns you on? What are the things? What is it about capturing humanity or capturing the beauty of this of, of creation that that just makes you tick? What got you into this in the first place? And whatever that is, I would say figure out some way to encapsulate that into as, as a compact an idea as possible and launch a creative project on your own, on the side of your business. That's what I would do. Um, with Misfit, I can say, it, I mean, I'm not, I'm no photographer, but I have launched creative, for instance, we just launched something called the, the Misfit Quarterly, of which there is professional photography in there. Um, it's a creative arts journal. We have professional photographers and artists and poets and, and essayists who have contributed to this. This is a completely creative project. Should have lost an enormous amount of money. And we launched it because we thought this is a cool idea to create an, an interesting platform where contemporary artists can get paid to publish their work in a really cool physical print edition. We launched it and we've had thousands of people interested in it. Now that project doesn't make us any money. Mm -hmm. It doesn't generate revenue for us, but it generates attention because it's interesting and because it's bold and because it's different. And it's only you know in a very ancillary way connected to our company, which is through this this ethos of, of, of defiance, you know. Um, but in the same way, if I ran a traditional shop as a photographer, I would say I would have those creative projects orbiting around maybe one, and then when that one's done, another one orbiting around my central business. Because these things, a business is not exciting typically, but projects around a business, creative projects around it, are exciting and, and can generate buzz, which in the end can generate revenue possible. That's excellent. What was the name of that project again? Because it kind of got a little bit garbled there in the transmission. Oh, sorry, yeah. It's called uh, the Misfit Quarterly. Misfit Quarterly, okay. All right. It's actually right, right there. Okay. The okay, so it's, it's, it's up here. Okay. All right, fantastic. And so this, uh, this idea then of uh, a photographer or any creative person ha having their business at the core and then outside of that creating these personal projects that help to draw the that those are the things that create the interest that bring people in and draw them in so that then yeah go ahead 
I, I would add to that creative and humanitarian or social projects as well. I think a photographer, say, if I'm a professional photographer and I launch a, a microblog about a project where I go to work with WaterAid UK in Malawi and I just take pictures of everything that I see, you know, and, and I'm putting those up and, and you do free work for, for the NGO while you're out there. Um, taking photographs of their work, which many NGOs do, but you bring that back to your tribe. It's something we did together. That's another very interesting thing that is fulfilling for you, mm -hmm. but also unique and something that people would actually want to pay attention to. Right. Yeah. It's. It, 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 I mean, listening to you talk about this, it, it it it's like opening a window onto a whole new world of possibilities for people. It, it it's. It, it's something that I think most photographers are, they're not thinking about because they're so wrapped up in their own problems of trying to run a business in the traditional sense. You know, I'm, I need to get my studio going, I need to get on social media, and I need to write a blog, and I need to send my emails out, and I need to have a sale, and I need to do this and this and this. And, and, and at the end of the day, they're coming away exhausted, but with no tangible um, or very little tangible result, you know, from their efforts. When, if they were to take some time out of that and say, "Okay, I'm just going to turn the business off for a, one day a week, perhaps, or you know, maybe just a, you know, maybe a few days a month, you know, if that was all that they could really spare." But to go out and do something that is so completely different to what anyone might expect me to do. But it's a creative, and I'm using my creative talents to do it. So I might be going out and documenting an inner city program that helps, uh, you know, uh, poor children actually learn something about nature or expose them to something yeah, or, new. Or, yeah, or a dilapidated area in your in your area in your neighborhood. You know, mm -hmm. something that's just interesting and kind of, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it and it gets people thinking and. Um, it, it, it's a, it acts as a sort of a pattern interrupt, so that when when people, you know, just regular people in your community come to the blog and they start reading and they say, "Oh, hang on a second, what's all this about?" You know, this you know this photographer's look at this. He's been out and he's paid attention to something that people just drive by every day and they don't care. You know, they're, they're heading backwards and forwards to work or Starbucks or wherever the heck it is that they go, uh, and. You know, you're introducing them and exposing them to something that they wouldn't normally see, and and if, and I think you know, if if you do it from a true sense of just doing it, just for the sake of doing it, and not thinking, oh well, now if I go out and do this project, then you know, people are going to think better of me, and they'll think I'm a charitable person, or all you know, that that's not the right way to approach it. It has to be something that resonates with your own soul, as it were, almost, that, that, that helps to generate those creative energies and, and, and get you thinking in, in different ways. And then when, when you then come back to the, what you might call the, the real world, I suppose, although it really isn't, but, you know, and, and you head out and you, to photograph someone's wedding, then what happens is that all of that, all, all of that inspiration that's been poured into your head from these other projects suddenly starts to emerge in a completely different way, yes. uh, allowing you then to create things at a, at a wedding that are unique and interesting and creative and artistic. Absolutely. Absolutely. And guess who people are going to want to work with? Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. guess who people are going to want to work with the guy that has all these interesting creative projects that he's done and these photo documentary micro blogs that he's put up about. You know, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's unique and that's bold and that's what's attractive. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I just love this. I'm going to switch my screen to a, a, one of your. Um, I think I think it's a PDF. I think that you had. Uh, let's see. This is this is your pursuit of everything website, and and I I'm really interested to learn a lot more about your uh, journey around the world too. I think that's really cool. But I know we're short on time. Um, let's see. Here we go. The life and times of a remarkable misfit. Now. Uh, this is a uh, this this is a, a PDF 
set of essays that you've put together over a period of time, sort of reflections and thoughts on the world and, and so on uh, as you've gone through your travels. And I recommend to everyone listening to this or watching this to, to go sign up for AJ's uh, newsletter, but also to get this document and read it because it's, it is very, very, very inspiring. And uh, there are some things in here that, I just, you know, they just, they really stop and make you think. And I think the other day, uh, your most recent newsletter that came out was called Beginnings. I think it was an excerpt from one of these essays in here where you had a whole bunch of first lines from, from different novels. And I was particularly struck by the fact that you had Arthur C. Clarke's uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey uh, one in there, which is very, very cool. That's one of my favorites, certainly. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I mean, I mean, how do you go about collecting these or writing these essays? Are they something that just kind of, something comes to you and you just write it down? Or is this a deliberate, uh, deliberate effort? Um, I mean, there was a long time there, Nigel, I'm going to be honest, where I thought, you know, I really think that I want to write a book someday. And I sat on, on that, I, that concept, of like, man, but it was such an overwhelming Thing that I never could even, it just wasn't soluble, you know. So as I started traveling around the world in this period while I was figuring out Misfit and building up Misfit over the last three years, traveling to 50-something countries, working on social projects and all this stuff, I just started saying, you know what, I'm just going to write. I'm just going to write essays as they come to me. So I'm just going to think of it as just as an entry in my in my journal. So most of these came from my actual journal. Like I wrote them. They're written essays that I wrote from places around the world. And I just, you know, um, their their thoughts. Every essay in there is a thought or a gleaning or just a verity that that I've come across or have learned through my travels and, and since leaving, since stopping living some other guy's life and starting to live my own. And I wanted to share that with the world. But the funny part about it is, I mean, I published that on August 16th of last year, and man, I sat on that publish button. And you talk about fear and the fear of, of, of putting your art out there. Um, it was two hours. I almost launched the site without it because I, I looked at me also and I'm like, I told her, I'm like, I don't think anyone's going to get this. I don't think anyone is going to get what I'm talking about and I am going to be the greatest fool of all, you know, which is, um, I think, a lot of our fears, um, a lot of our fears when we get to it. Um, so, I, I, but I ended up hitting publish anyway and now it's been downloaded almost 100,000 times and it's, we're actually launching a Kickstarter to turn it into a physical book next week, and it's just you know it's crazy, but it's that this I put my entire soul into what you have on the screen right now. <laughs> I put everything into it. So that's all I got left. No, no, I, no, I, I am more than confident that you have way more left. Uh, than what is in here, and that you will you will discover uh, and uncover those future nuggets on your on your travels and adventures. I I, I know we we've been going for a while, and I just have a couple of questions left before we finish up. Uh, one of the one of the quotes that I that I or uh, sayings I came across in in this uh, in this book was, "Nothing in life is more dangerous than comfort," and that struck a real chord with me um, because you know I, I think we we do get comfortable with the way things are we we can get very comfortable with uh, sometimes being in a, even in a bad place you know in our lives we just kind of get used to it and uh, we can uh, and it kind of it, it resonates with me because it goes together with something that uh, one of my other mentors, David Nagel, said, which is, we have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Hmm. Hmm. And and you know, and these two statements just fit together so well uh, for me. Now, what what can we, what little nugget of advice can we offer photographers who, 
you know, they're, they're making it, you know, they're doing okay, they're maybe making a reasonable living, they're, they're perhaps not feeling entirely satisfied as creatives, but, you know, it's okay, you know, life is good, they're not destitute, they're not going to lose their house, but at the same time, their, their life compass, if you like, isn't really pointed in any particular direction, they're just kind of going from day to day. What, what can we offer them to help set their pants on fire, if you like, and get them out of that comfort zone? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think a lot of times discomfort either comes looking for you and or you decide to shake things up yourself in your life. And you either, I mean, as humans, we are, especially in our kind of society, we are, we are geared to just desire security and safety and to get to ourselves a place where we're just okay. I mean, we have our house and it's paid off got our 401k and everything's good, my business is profitable. And then we just kind of sit, forgetting all the while that as seconds are ticking off the clock that this is our one and only life. We only get one. And I think most people, if they are honest with themselves, they want their one and only life to be a grand adventure that at the end of it, they would love to read over again. You know, something that is just truly extraordinary. And if that's your desire, when you really sit down and you say, you know what, I, 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 want, I would love my life to be a grand adventure, then go out and make it happen. But grand adventure, you know, Frodo doesn't skip into Mordor and, and just uh, plant, uh, plant the the the, the <laughs> dude, you know? I mean, yeah. and, and if he did, no one would give a shit. You know? <laughs> the, the fact that, that he goes through all, all these ups and downs, that grand adventure is what makes the story worth reading. And I think a grand adventure is what makes a life worth living. And, and I would say to any photographer or any creative of, of, of any type, as a creative, we've, you know, anyone who has that creative spirit in them, you've been bestowed with something that many people don't have, the ability to see things that others don't, and the possibility of creating something that was never there or never will be without you conceptualizing it. And that is a powerful thing to have, and it is one of the key ingredients of a life that's certainly worth living in a grand adventure. So that's my little... Wow. That is... Um, that's, that's, that's an amazing thing to think upon. And, you know, I, I think... Uh, it, it also f feeds into the one of the biggest complaints that I hear photographers giving me all the time is they say to me, well, you know, we can't sell anything to our customers now because they're just happy to accept less than stellar quality is good enough. And, um, you know, obviously I, I, I think that as creative people, I think we should reject that, that idea wholesale. Absolutely. And... Uh, you know, I was my my last question here was, you know, as creative people, what can we do about that? And you just literally, you just answered the question before I even really ever asked it, which you know is to aim to to live a life that's bigger than the one that you lived yesterday, and step. Be, don't be afraid to step out and do something that it either is something that you, you may be afraid of or something that uh, people don't expect you to do. Uh, you know, that this idea that, oh, well, I, you know, I, what, what will people think if I screw up? You know, if I, if I totally screw this up, what are people going to think? And most people uh, that I, you know, teach and most of the photographers that are watching this don't realize that when I started doing these uh, webinars and, and interviews and such like, I had the biggest fear of screwing this up. I mean, I, it was like, oh my God, you know, uh, here I am thinking about interviewing people who are much smarter than I am, uh, and yet, uh, what, what, what if I say something stupid? What if I look, make myself look like a chimpanzee in front of all these people? <laughs> And <laughs> I was terrified, but uh, you know, then I, I found that I actually enjoyed doing it. I, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm that great at it, but I, but I, I love doing it. It's something that I never would have imagined 
that I I like doing so much, and uh, so you just don't know what you're going to discover about yourself and, and the things that you can do. Um, my uh, my mum, uh, <laughs> she. Uh, <laughs> I, re I remember uh, when I when I'd lived in Bermuda back then. I was doing scuba diving, and I she she came out uh, with my dad to to visit for a time. And uh, now she <laughs> she said to me, "Would you teach me to scuba dive?" And I was like, "Excuse me," <laughs> you know. And she was like in her sixties, you know. And she's like, oh. "Well, okay, uh, sure, yeah, I'll, we can give that a go." And, and well. So I took her on a little sort of tri dive around the, the local bay uh, in about four feet of water because I, I didn't dare take her any, <laughs> any deeper than that. And uh, she held onto my hand the whole entire way, and I swear to God that to this day the bones are still cracking in my hand from the <laughs> sheer force that she put on it. I bet. I bet. But you know, she she did something that. I never expected her to even want to do, you know, and, and she really enjoyed it. And she actually went on to, when she went back to the UK, she signed up for a diving class and actually became a master scuba diver. It was just, it blew me away. And, you know, and I wish that more people would do stuff like this. I wish that more people would actually just be brave about stuff and, and just think, you know, the heck with it. I don't care what other people think. I don't care if I screw up. I can look like a clown for five minutes because it doesn't matter because somebody else will, another clown will be along very shortly, you know, to take their attention away. So yeah, it doesn't. Right. <laughs> so, you know, AJ, I think that what you're doing is absolutely fantastic. I think this, um, the, you know, the, the path that you've put yourself on and, uh, and you've got Melissa there, of course, with you, uh, on this journey too, which is fantastic. Hmm? Yeah. She's my muse. Yeah, and uh, you know it, it's 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 funny because I um, you know I think back to my days back in the corporate world and I and I try to imagine or remember myself sitting in that cubicle every day behind the computer tapping away on the keyboard writing programs and I, and I enjoyed it and I was good at it but I can't reconcile that memory anymore it's 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 almost as though it belongs to somebody else and. Uh, I feel the same way. Uh, I'm with you. And if somebody came to me and said, you know, Nigel, you're going to have to go back tomorrow to that life and that's it, uh, I'd be like, okay, where's the nearest cyanide pill? Because I... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I need to hang myself right now. Yeah. Uh, I would say, if everyone would bother, because uh, I, I would be fired in a week anyway. They, 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 they wouldn't yeah. be able to stand having me around because I'd just argue too much. You know, I'd, I used to be all conformist and yes, yes, sir, and yes, Mr. Johns, and, and all this, and like, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I, and I worked with a guy one time, and, and this was years and years ago, and, and I said to my... Uh, the guy that was sitting across the desk from me is a bit like you know Jim and Dwight in the office, you know, and I don't say who was who. I, I'll probably rather be Jim than Dwight, but anyway. Yeah. And I said to this, I said, you know, what 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 is it with that guy? I said every time I see him, he, he looks miserable. He's got his head down. He looks like somebody just killed his pet cat. You know, what, what's up with him? And he said, he said, well, um, he said you probably feel the same way if you were forced to come back to work here after spending the last twelve months driving around the Sahara Desert. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and you win, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, and I totally understand it now. I couldn't go back to that life with, and and uh, and still, you know, feel in any way creative. It would just kill kill anything. I just would not like it. Oh, I'm, I'm with you. There's no way. So uh, anyway, well, I've taken up uh, you know some of your time today, and I really appreciate it, AJ. You know, and as much as I hate to, we probably should wrap this up here. And you know, I really enjoyed chatting with you. I, I I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, this this uh, this interview that we've had, and and I look forward to keeping up with more of your amazing ideas and uh, reading the. The Life and Times Part Two when it comes out. <laughs> I'm holding you to that one, okay? <laughs> and <laughs> and thank you so much for taking the time out to do this with me. I, it, I know that we've 
we've had a little difficulty getting this scheduled. I know that your your truck broke down or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. We're just like we've had three breakdowns. It's been it's a mess. But I'm well, so no, no, it's an adventure. That's what it is. It's an adventure. So I'm I'm glad that we were finally able to connect up this way, and uh, and I'll make sure that people listening to this can find your website that they can get, sign up for your newsletter. I will personally beat them over the head with a stick until they <laughs> they do get it, and that's um, all I do. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Just get a big enough stick and they'll do anything. So exactly. with that, it's been a real pleasure having you here, and and I wish you and Melissa uh, adventurous and safe travels on your road ahead. Thank you so much, Nigel. It's been great hanging out with you.